Well, we find ourselves at 6.30, so let us begin with prayer. God, you have taught us to keep your heavenly commandments by loving you and our neighbor. Grant us the spirit of peace and grace that we may be both devoted to you with our whole heart and united to each other with a pure will. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. So we find ourselves on page 52. And I noticed that there, there's a mistake there at the top. We're actually looking at 1 Corinthians 11, um, 17 to 34. So we'll jump, we'll jump into that and just recall kind of what we've been talking here about in this section, um, chapters 10 and 11, talking about taking temptation seriously, began with that, that conversation, that, that reminder to the, to the Corinthians about what happened in the past with the Israelites, um, and that was all written down as a warning, and then he goes into that aspect of idolatry, speaking about that idolatry. Here's, here's what you should learn from that, flee from that idolatry, um, don't make yourself a partner with, with the demons, which is ultimately what's taking place in that idolatry. Um, then he jumped into a little section on that aspect of um, the, the conscience again. Um, if, if, if you go somewhere and, and somebody's there with you, and, and they say this was sacrificed to the demons, well then don't, don't eat at all, and, and ultimately summed it up with that idea, whether, whether you eat or drink, whatever you do, do it all to the glory of God. Um, and then we ended last time speaking about really what he had to say about um, roles of men and women in regard to some customs, but also what was um, the principles that were timeless. And now he jumps into another, another one of the difficulties, another one of the problems that was taking place within the congregation. And, and this section isn't so much actually about the Lord's Supper, even though he deals in great length with the Lord's Supper, but it's really much more about favoritism and an unloving attitude that was taking place. And so he really um, expresses Here's, here's what the Lord's Supper is all about, and, and he, he lays that before them with the prayer that they would, they would see the grace in, in, the, in the supper, and that would lead them to really gather around in love rather than basing everything on, on income, really, of, of what was taking place, who was rich and who wasn't, and, and, and kind of the cliquishness that was taking place. So we'll jump into a lengthier section, 17 to 34. Um, a lot of instructive words here, however. Now, in giving you this next command, I do not praise you. A rather scathing remark when you stop and think about it. I do not praise you. Because you come together, not for the better, but for the worse. And, and pause there for a moment and, and take a look at the you come together aspect of things. Um, if you see it under the notes, it will kind of help you understand the rest of what we read. Um, you come together is referencing what was known as the love feast, um, which, was, which was commonly done amongst believers in the early Christian church. And to explain the, the love feast, um, you'll see what I've written down there below. This is what really kind of happened. Because remember, a lot of this, this worship took place in homes. Um, and so, so worship was conducted in the evening and was preceded by what we would call a potluck supper. This could and should have been a time of warm Christian fellowship and sharing. 
However, the more affluent members arrived early and ate and drank to excess. The working people and slaves who could not arrive until later were going hungry. Some ended up famished and offended because the meal was over by the time they arrived. Others got so drunk that they hardly knew what was going on. And that was the atmosphere in which the leftover bread and wine were then consecrated and the Lord's Supper was celebrated. Um, it's, it's no wonder he has such scathing, scathing um, remarks for them. I, I do not praise you. Um, historical church records um, would, would show that kind of the format that was followed is, is what you read there. But, you know, before eating, the, the guests would arrive and, and they'd, they'd wash their hands. They'd have prayer and, and scripture reading. And then after that, um, there was the meal and then a collection for the widows and, and the orphans. And then after that, any correspondence between other congregations, other areas, writings back and forth. So th this was a common thing. It was called the love feast. Um, but you see that this had really grown into a, a great abuse. And, and what, what was taking place, we'll see, was, was not something the Lord would condone, not something the Lord would, would approve of. Yes, Gemma. Um, we'll read, we'll read. Um, verse 18. For in the first place, I hear that when you come together in an assembly, there are divisions among you. And to some extent, I believe it. For there also have to be factions among you, so that those who are approved may become evident among you. Um, kind of a strange statement there, but really emphasizing this aspect that in the times of dissension, in the times of turmoil, oftentimes you'll kind of find out who the true and tested believers and members are. Um, and that's kind of what he's saying there as well. Um, our approved may become evident among you. So when you come together in the same place, it is not the Lord's Supper that you eat. Now, now Paul is not saying that they're not receiving the body and blood of, of Christ. Um, ultimately, whenever the words of institution are used, um, with the bread and the wine, the body and blood are present. Um, it's, it's one of the reasons why, as we'll see, that somebody who is not prepared should not receive it because they're sinning against the body and blood of the Lord. But what he is saying is not the Lord's Supper that you eat. This is not at all what the Lord intended. Um, this is not at all what, what he has in mind for you when you celebrate the sacrament of Holy Communion. He could not approve of this. Um, this is not what Jesus wants. For when you eat... Each one goes ahead and takes his own supper. And so one person goes hungry while another is drunk. What, don't you have houses to eat and drink in? Or do you despise God's church and humiliate those who have nothing? What am I, what am I to say to you? Shall I praise you? In this matter, I do not praise you. For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night when he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after the meal, he also took the cup, saying, This cup is the New Testament in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Um, and it's, you know, we, we rightfully recognize the sacrament as receiving Christ's body and blood for the forgiveness of sins. But notice what's also taking place, a remembrance and a proclamation. Um, every time that we receive the sacrament of communion, um, we are remembering his death, that, that crucial event upon which our salvation depends. And every time that we receive the sacrament of Holy Communion, we're proclaiming. We're proclaiming to the Christians, to non-Christians. We're proclaiming to everyone that Christ gave his body and blood to redeem all of mankind. Um, a remembrance, a proclamation, as well as a reception of the, uh, excuse me, of the forgiveness of sins. Verse 27. Therefore, whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of sinning against the Lord's body and blood. Instead, let a person examine himself, and after doing so, let him eat of the bread and drink from the cup. For if anyone eats and drinks in an unworthy way, because he does not recognize the Lord's body, he eats and drinks judgment on himself. 
Because of this, many among you are weak and sick, and quite a few have fallen asleep. But if we judged ourselves, we would not be undergoing judgment. However, when we undergo judgment, we are being disciplined by the Lord, so that we may not be condemned with the world. Therefore, my brothers, when you come together to eat, wait for one another. If anyone is hungry, let him eat at home, so that your coming together may not result in judgment. The rest of my instructions I will give when I come. So let's take a look at the search in the scriptures, question one. Modern day abuses of the Lord's Supper are different, but just as real and serious. What is unworthy eating and drinking of the sacrament? So what is it that would make an individual unworthy in their reception of the sacrament of Holy Communion? Penny. So one of them would be not recognizing, not believing that the body and blood of Christ are present there together with the bread and wine. Um, that'd be one way an individual would receive it in an unworthy um, manner. Jeff. And so, if we are holding a, a, a grudge against somebody or have not forgiven that individual um, and receive the sacrament of communion, we would be receiving it in an unworthy manner as well. Scott? Uh, not preparing yourself by being repentant for your sins. Not feeling true sorrow over our sins. Not being repentant for, for our sins would lead an individual to be unworthy in that reception of the sacrament. Evan. Um, I guess this kind of comes in the recognizing that Christ is through presence, but if, if like, um, late stage dementia might be advised to it, uh, do that if they don't recognize the same of the identification of Sure, sure. And, and an aspect of an individual can't remember um, what it is that Christ has done, um, that individual wouldn't receive it. And, and I would say that is, is more going to fall upon the one administering it than it is going to be necessarily falling on the one who's coming to receive it um, in that regard um, to, to be sure that they can properly prepare themselves. Um, Rachel? Yeah, and I think that that would that's an a example of probably of, of not being repentant, but certainly would feel, fall in line with that aspect. Jeff? Along with uh, the preparation to be somebody that has been taught to, to know what it is that you're doing. And so therefore you shouldn't if you don't know what you're doing. So if someone doesn't know anything about Christ's death, um, what it accomplished, um, you know, do this in remembrance of me and do this in proclamation. Um, if somebody doesn't know that Jesus died for their sins, they can't really do it in remembrance of him, can they? Um, and, and we could say, too, you know, an individual who just thoughtlessly, mindlessly goes up there without even, you know, any aspect of it um, and, and closely tied to that. Um, if, somebody who, if somebody refrains from receiving it, altogether for no good reason, but they, they claim to be a Christian, um, that would be an abuse of it as well. Um, and so in the situation of these Corinthians here, um, their lack of love was demonstrating a lack of repentance. Um, and, and thus the apostle really um, comes to them and rebukes them. Yes, Gemma? Proclamation is to proclaim, to speak out, to, to, to declare, to, to make known. On question two, what was happening to many in the Corinthian congregation because they were eating and drinking the Lord's Supper in an unworthy manner? All right, and when it speaks about sleep, what's that talking about? <laughs> it's talking about death. Yeah. Yeah. Um, we can we could kind of summarize it in the sense of what was taking place. They 
we're being judged by the Lord. Um, that's really what's, what's being said there. Um, and what was some of the judgment including? Weakness, sickness, even death. Um, if ever there was a temptation to think that God isn't all that serious about us taking his sacraments seriously, all one needs to do is look at these words. Um, the Spirit inspired the Apostle Paul to be able to know that some of these sicknesses, some of these weaknesses, some of these deaths were a direct result of a discipline from God for their abuse of this sacrament. Now, understand the judgment that's being spoken about here is not an eternal judgment that is being referenced. Um, the, the reference is to the fact that this is a sin, is not speaking to condemnation in hell. Um, we can say that for two reasons. Number one is the Greek word that's used here is, is the word that does not refer to condemnation. And the other thing too is there would not be the reference to falling asleep if it was simply an aspect of condemnation. Because the Bible never refers to um, an individual who dies in unbelief as falling asleep. It's always a reference to a believer. Yes, Rudy. That'd be a fair statement, um, and, and that's a fair statement not only on the base of what we read here, but especially what we'll read in this aspect of spiritual gifts next. Um, I think it's less of an aspect of them not needing to pay attention to the sacrament, but rather the aspect of um, their superiority led them to act in an unloving manner towards one another, and thus they were receiving it in an unloving, unrepentant way. Um, not so much maybe a case of, of their disregard for, for the sacrament. I don't need to do that because I'm better, but really their better attitude or their attitude of being better was leading them to an unrepentant, unloving attitude towards others. I'm digging deeper, question A. Some criticize the practice of close or closed communion as being unloving and judgmental. What good reasons for this practice does Paul mention? Rudy. Yeah, and, and I, would, I would use the word judgment um, in, in that regard. Be, and the reason I say that is because the Lord is not saying here through Paul that if, if an individual has received it in an improper matter, manner, that automatically they're, being, they're going to be damned. Um, there is forgiveness for it. Um, but correct. Um, what the Apostle Paul says here really is he's, he's reminding the Corinthians, we're being reminded that everything about the sacrament, the purpose is for channeling blessings to the recipient, not receiving it for spiritual harm. And yet if an individual doesn't know Christ's death and what it means, if an individual is not repentant, if an individual is not united and therefore not knowing what it is that they do confess, what's the danger? The danger is that this then becomes a channel for judgment rather than for blessing. Um, the, the practice of, of close communion is all about protecting the communicant to make sure the communicant receives it in a way that's beneficial for them. Um, and, and so 
what's oftentimes looked as uh, judgment, judgmental and unloving is actually the height of love. Question B, how do the words of this section, together with the words of 1 Corinthians 10, 16, below, support the teaching that a communicant receives Christ's true body and blood, as well as real bread and wine in the sacrament of Holy Communion? So, so think especially of verses 23 um, through 29, and then verse 16 there as well. Evan. If it were merely bread and wine, then there would be no reason for judgment because the people at that time would have been eating bread and wine on a daily basis. Because of the um, practice, because of the words of institution, that is where the important set is and why it's so critical to examine oneself. So there'd be, no, there'd be no judgment if, if it was only bread and wine. And, and in that section that you're referring to, um, notice what he says. You are, you are eating and drinking and sinning against the, the body and blood. It doesn't, doesn't just say um, bread and wine, but body and blood. And, and isn't it interesting that in that entire section there, bread, wine, body, blood, all used in an interchangeable way, aren't they? They just it's back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. Just really emphasizing this aspect of all four are present: um, bread, wine, body, and blood. What else do we see there in in those words? Annette? It's obvious what Jesus says. This is my body. This is my It's obvious, but it's worth pointing out again. Um, the Apostle Paul echoes the same words of Jesus. Um, he says, this is what was given to me. This, this is my body. This is my blood. And is, is means is. Um, as he gave him the bread, this is my body. This is my blood. I'm all for, for a present. And then if you think about that 1 Corinthians 10, 16 passage that's below, um, this is the EHV translation. We are, we are probably more, more um, familiar with, with the idea of a participation rather than the word communion there, but both of them mean the same thing. You know, the cup of blessing that we bless, what's that referring to? It's referring to the wine. Is it not a communion of the blood of Christ? What, is a communion? what does communion mean? It means together. It means there. You know, I always use the illustration that, that if we're going to use the word participate, um, if, if I'm going to participate in the basketball game at the London Center, where do I have to be? I have to be at the London Center. I, I have to be present. If, if the wine is going to participate with the blood, if there's going to be a communion of the wine and the blood, what has to be there? Both of them. If there is going to be a participation of the, the bread and the body, what has to be there? Both of them. Um, there can't be a participation if both aren't present. There can't be a communion if both aren't present. And so we see here, as well as our Savior's words in, in the Gospels, emphasizing that truth. It's not just bread and wine that people receive. It's not changing into to body and blood, and so that's all that person receives. It is a person receives the bread and the wine and the body and blood. And, and the Lutheran theologians sought to try and bring that truth across in that, that phrase that perhaps you've heard, in, with, and under. Um, you know, the body and blood of Christ is in, with, and under the bread and wine. Um, what, are they, what are they trying to say? What well, you you can't pinpoint where, where, where it is. You, you can't take a, a magnifying glass and stick a, the bread underneath it and, and see some elements of, of body in there. But it's there because Christ says it is. Um, and I, I, always, I always love to point out the fact, too, um, why 
should this bother us? And, and by the grace of God and the, and the Spirit working faith in our hearts, it doesn't. But, I mean, we, we generally say, yeah, I believe Jesus was born of a virgin. Explain that one to me. We generally are, are quick to say, yep, he walked on water. Explain that one to me. And we, we're okay with not explaining that one. But then all of a sudden we want an explanation for how I can taste wine and taste bread, but I'm also receiving his body and blood. Why do we need the explanation to fit reason the way we want it? Um, and, and that's the disciples, right? There they are sitting. Jesus gives them bread, gives them wine, says, take and eat, this is my body. They had seen all these things. There was no reason for them to question. All right, Jesus, if that's what you say, take you at your word. And that's what we do too. If that's what you say, I'll take you at your word. Yes, Rudy. The earlier, uh, the early theologians like Swindling and that era um, went, and, and they're part of this war movement of presentation. Would they have reasoned that to be true? There's, there's two, two main reasons as to why. Um, that idea really was borne out. Number one is, is the attempt to have an explanation that fits reason, just like you said. Um, how can the body and blood of Christ be present there? Um, it doesn't make sense to me. And the second one is that it, it, it demonstrates the fact that one false doctrine always leads to another false teaching, and that is they believe Jesus is confined to heaven. So if Jesus is confined to heaven, he can't be present everywhere that the sacrament's being celebrated. And that's the other reason. That's, we're, we're referencing a false teaching. Um, it is not true that Jesus is confined to heaven. He is, he is present. Turning the page then to our new material here. Unless there was another question or comment. So we'll be on to page 54. It's the new material that would have been sitting on the table. We jump into chapters 12 and 13, and we look at them under the heading Gifts for Service. Um, a verse worth memorizing, 1 Corinthians 12, 7, which says, Each person is given a manifestation of the Spirit, for the common good, and where are we going? Having discussed good order at public worship and the proper observance of the Lord's Supper, Paul proceeds to another point of church order, namely, the nature and use of spiritual gifts. The Corinthians were having trouble properly using their spiritual gifts, so Paul leads them to see that the Holy Spirit, who leads people to faith in Jesus Christ, also gives them a variety of gifts. With these gifts, Christians are enabled to render a variety of services for the common good of the church. That happens when the gifts are used in love. So verses 1 to 11 of chapter 12. Um, now concerning spiritual gifts, and this is, is what we're going to be talking about this whole chapter 12, and really 13 just is, is building on that, even though it's the love chapter, it's really building upon the use of proper spiritual gifts. Um, so let's give a definition to what we mean by a spiritual gift. Um, a good definition would be this, an ability given by the Spirit that enables a Christian to serve the Lord and the needs of others in the church. That's what a spiritual gift is. Um, an ability given by the Spirit that enables a Christian to serve the Lord and the needs of others in the church. And obviously the Corinthians had inquired about spiritual gifts as well. Here's Paul again. Now, concerning spiritual gifts. And the situation in Corinth obviously was serious enough that the Apostle Paul actually spends the, the lion's share of three chapters on spiritual gifts and the proper use of them. Um, and, and not that it should surprise us if you go all the way back to the beginning. Um, the use of spiritual gifts and the way one would look at their spiritual 
spiritual gifts would very much lead to what? A clickishness. And we see that right away from the beginning. So, um, covers three chapters. Yes, Evan? You mean the question? Yeah, yeah, um, spiritual Correct. So, so many of the things as, as we come across now about, he says a number of times, now about, now about, now about, um, would have been things either referenced in that letter they sent to him or brought to him by those who brought that letter to him. So continuing on. Now concerning spiritual gifts, brothers, I do not want you to be uninformed. You know that when you were pagans, you were deceived and somehow led away to mute idols. Um, when, when you were pagans, um, kind of an interesting thing, I, I, I read through that and I said to myself, but how much would I like it um, for, to be reading or hearing, you know, when you were a pagan? Um, and then I said, but you know what, that's something that all of us need to hear because there was a time when we were technically a pagan. Um, and, and I think that's one of those things that, that while we, will, while we readily admit, because by the grace of God we've been led to believe it and see it in Scripture, that we are born sinful and that we are outside of God's kingdom, it just sounds a whole lot different and a whole lot more serious when, when we have to admit, rightfully so, there was a day, a moment, when I was an unbeliever and I was going to hell. Every individual has to say it. What happens to babies? What's that? What happens to them? Well, that's why the Lord gives us baptism. Um, and, and ultimately, we can only say what the Bible has to say. And what the Bible has to say that is apart from faith being created to trust in Jesus Christ, that's the only way to heaven. Um, And that's where we have to stop and say that the Lord says the only way that an individual is able to enter into heaven is, is by means of faith in, in Jesus Christ. And he gives us the, the blessing of baptism um, to know that beyond the shadow of a doubt. Um, the natural response that we want to say is, boy, they didn't have an opportunity. Well, how could they go be sent to hell? Um, and my response to that would be, that's downplaying the reality that everybody enters this world, an unbeliever, and um, under the control of Satan. If the Lord, in his infinite wisdom, and in his love, um, has another way, he hasn't revealed it to us. And so we, we cannot say more than the Bible says. Um, and I would also say that there is a difference between the individual who says, I have no desire to have anything to do with God, and therefore my child gets nothing to have as far as to do with God either. Um, and perhaps that child that never even leaves the womb alive. But in both situations, it's a matter of saying, let's stick with what the Bible says and then leave the rest into the hands of God so we don't say something he doesn't say. Um, to, the, to the believer, there's a whole lot more that one can say um, than to the unbeliever. And, and I would say this, um, to the believer who, let's say, um, miscarries, to the believer who has a stillborn, to the believer who has a child born on, on Thursday and tends to have them baptized on Sunday and on Saturday, de Saturday they die from sudden infant death syndrome, um, I would say to that believer, everything that God has done from the moment that sin has entered in this world, has been to make it possible for mankind to enjoy the bliss of heaven with him. And for some reason, he did not allow 
this child of yours to get to the point of being able to be baptized. Place all your confidence into the hands of a God who desperately loves you. And that's what I would say. Because I can't say more, because the Bible doesn't. But I'm not going to say less, because the Bible does tell us we have a loving God. Um, I, I can't say the same thing to the unbeliever, because number one, the unbeliever doesn't even care about that. Um, rather, for the unbeliever, I would simply say, let's, let's just talk about God. Let's talk about what Jesus did for you. Um, and then God's promise is, is that the love of Christ and all that he's done for us will also give us the strength to not know the answer until we get to heaven. Yes, Rudy. Correct. So I said miscarriage, stillborn, one that was one that was um, intended to be baptized and then unable to make it to the to the water. Yes, Gemma. Where is pagan? What is it? So a pagan, um, if you were to look at it in the dictionary definition of it, it is it is somebody who is holding to religious beliefs other than those that are kind of recognized as the main religion. Um, what's interesting is the Greek word that is used there is, is ethne, which is the word that's oftentimes just simply translated nations or Gentile. Um, the reason for that is because um, the pagan would have been the one who didn't believe in the God of the Bible, like the Christian or the Jew did. Um, and ultimately, every unbeliever is a pagan because they have another God. So to make it short, the meteorite cow would be non-believer? Correct. Correct. Um, um, they could be an atheist with no God, but ultimately there's really honestly no such thing because even the atheist has a God. They just don't realize it. It's themselves. But you are correct. Um, it's just that, that people, don't, people don't often realize that the atheist does have a God. Um, they're just denying the fact that that God could possibly be. Correct. 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 Uh, I, I, I did notice I skipped that little um, paragraph, though, under concerning spiritual gifts. Let me read that before we get back into our, our, our text. Um, spiritual gifts are more than the natural abilities we inherit from our parents or learn from a teacher. The Holy Spirit can cultivate these gifts, but the spiritual gifts, as Paul describes them here, appear to be abilities beyond or outside what we would consider natural talents. The Holy Spirit gives them for the specific purpose of equipping us to meet the spiritual needs of people. Um, so he can, he can cultivate those natural talents into spiritual gifts, but he can also simply give brand new ones. Um, and, and as I was going through this too, I, I just, I mean, how often, do we, how often do we pray, and perhaps we should pray more frequently, if we, if we see something that needs to be done within the church, say, Holy Spirit, would you give us the gifts. Um, I mean, certainly this, this lesson would lead us to say, pray that, pray boldly. Um, he give, it's not just simply a case that he's, he's given once and he's done and he steps back. He gives them as needed also. So let's jump back into to our text. Um, verse three. Therefore I am informing you that no one speaking by God's spirit says a curse be upon Jesus, and no one can say Jesus is Lord except by the Holy Spirit. There's the greatest gift the spirit bestows, right? Saving faith. There are various kinds of gifts, but the same spirit. There are different kinds of ministries, and yet the same Lord. There are various kinds of activity, but the same God, who produces all of them in everyone. Each person is given a manifestation of the spirit for the common good. To one person, a message of wisdom is given by the Spirit. To another, a message of knowledge, as the same Spirit provides it. By the same Spirit, faith is given to someone else. And to another, the same Spirit gives healing gifts. 
another is given powers to do miracles, another the gift of prophecy, another the evaluating of spirits, someone else different kinds of tongues, and another the interpretation of tongues. One and the same spirit produces all of these, distributing them to each one individually as he desires. I don't want to stop too often in the middle of it and just completely lose the flow of thought, Um, but verses four, five, and six, you you kind of just see um, when you come across ministries and activity, um, it's really just the the, the apostle as he's he's inspired by by the spirit, Um, ministries and and activity simply seems to be talking about the gifts being put into operation. It's it's just kind of referencing the gifts. It's another way of speaking of the gifts. It's just the gifts being used. Um, And then I was going to say, too, if if you ever noticed how many times pastors in sermons um, always give examples in threes, um, look at Paul did it, too. Um, and, and I always think, too, you know, the Trinity is just the threes. Um, I had my, my pastor that I served under my vicar year, he said, um, my sermons got a lot shorter when I stopped doing threes. <laughs> he was older than I was, so I haven't gotten there yet. <laughs> Question one, searching the scriptures. Interesting. <laughs> Question one, what great purpose are spiritual gifts to serve? Annette. Meet the spiritual needs of people. Needs of people. Um, you think about the end of verse 7, right? Why has he given this manifestation of the Spirit? For the common good. Um, spiritual gifts are service-oriented. That's what they're for. They're they're for service. And think about this. The Corinthians needed to hear that. We need to hear that. Gifts are not given for the sake of personal or group prestige. Spiritual gifts are not given to make us look good or to feel good good. And, and do take note of that second comment, not to make us feel good either. Now, don't completely misunderstand me. I'm not saying that we can't or shouldn't enjoy the fact that we are able to use the gifts for the service of others. And I'm not saying that a person you know, you should say, don't ever say anything nice to me after I've used my spiritual gift. But what I am saying is we need to always be careful that the use of the spiritual gift doesn't become self-serving. Uh, and probably you've heard it before. Um, it maybe has even crossed your mind before. But the, I, I, the, the, the person who says or, or the thought that comes in, well, I do that for that person because it makes me feel so good. That service has now just been turned right around to be only for my good. Um, That's not why he's given me those spiritual gifts. Um, We always have to fight against that selfishness in in so many different aspects of our life. Um, Like I said, it does not mean that we can't feel good, but we don't want that to be the reason why we're doing it, to make me feel good. We could probably answer that on both sides, and a little bit of it would be a matter of really what is the heart and the attitude. I mean, you, you've given one specific aspect. Um, an individual might say, I don't want to do that. I don't feel I have the gifts to do that. I'll do that because it needs to get done. And they're happy to do it even, I shouldn't say happy, but they're willing to do it 
because they know it's, gonna, it's for the benefit and the best for the church because no one else has done it. Um, but the Christian does want to stay away from an aspect of doing it grudgingly. Um, and I, I, I want to be careful of, of specifically labeling it as a sin because um, you, you look at the way that there, there's never a, a, the use of a gift that's done perfectly. Um, there, there's always going to be an aspect there. But when we get to, to chapter 13, um, and, and he speaks about this aspect of, of, of really demonstrating and using our gifts with love driving everything, um, a Christian can, with love driving them, do something they don't feel they're very good at, and it's not the most enjoyable for them. But they do it because they love the Lord and they love their fellow believers. Um, and so it really is, is it comes down to that attitude. Probably a better, a better way to look at it, a better way to speak of it is, is simply saying is, is perhaps there are times, though, for the Christian to say or to not do it. And if it's ultimately not something that is going to mean um, the lack of the, the word of God being, being shared, and, and sometimes, we, sometimes we get into this mindset of saying, this will never get done if I don't do it. It's not actually true. It will get done. Or maybe there's a reason why it's not going to be done. Um, and it needs to happen that it's not done so people can recognize something or see something. And so sometimes there also needs to be this aspect of, of the believer recognizing, I don't need to feel guilted into doing this um, in that regard as well. Correct. Um, and, but the question is, is, we can speak of begrudgingly or a lack of desire to do it in two different ways. You know, a person could very much say, I, I don't want to do that, but I will because I do believe that this has to be done or else is not going to get done. And, and that person may be completely doing it out of love for their Savior, love for their fellow believers, even though it's not something they're, they're eager to do. But uh, begrudgingly aware, the whole entire time, um, what's just filling my heart and my mind is, is an attitude of disdain, an attitude of, of um, you know, even anger, frustration at everybody else, then the answer would be yes. It'd be better to say no. Um, because uh, if it's not done in love, it's just a, 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 resound, a resounding symbol, a gong, as he speaks about in, in, thir in chapter 13. Yes, Gemma. Begrudging. Begrudging would have the idea of doing it, but the whole entire time you're doing it, you want nothing to do with it. What about if this really happens? If somebody does down my throat about something that Yeah, so, so what, you, what you are referencing is, is a point that, that is good to bring up, but is, is not the same aspect of, of the use of spiritual gifts. So, so what you would be referencing is more so on the aspect of what does the Lord want me to do 
in these relationships with people. And if, if I've been hurt or if somebody else has been hurt by me, and how does he want me to go about um, dealing with that? And, and so if I'm holding a grudge, which is I'm not forgiving somebody, um, that's really what you're referring to. And the Lord would say, um, first and foremost, is um, go and speak to that individual. And in, in your heart, even before you go and speak to them, is to, to forgive them, and then also to do all you can to, to make amends with that individual or to let them know you've forgiven them. But the idea of the begrudging is the idea of doing something when you don't want to do it. And so it's not talking about holding a grudge. Correct. Um, I didn't, that's all I said. I didn't get mad or cuss him out or nothing, you know. I just took off with my cat, you know. Um, yep, and, and, and we, can, we can speak to it further, too, um, out, outside, of, outside of the class here. But one thing I would say is that if, if you haven't spoken to that person since, and, and I don't know if it's because you've avoided him or not, but perhaps that might betray how you actually feel is if you've been avoiding him, is that maybe it, it has um, kind of simmered within you more than, more than you think. Simmered? Yeah, correct. Question two. What three important points does Paul make about spiritual gifts in verses four to six? All right, so number one, those spiritual gifts, they're given in great variety and great abundance, aren't they? Rudy. They all come from the same source, don't they? Come from the Holy Spirit, from, from our God. And the last one would be found in the last phrase of verse 6. Every believer has one. In fact, oftentimes believers have more than one. Yeah. Three, three points. Um, spiritual gifts engraved in great variety and abundance, all come from the same source, and every believer has received his or her own gift or gifts. And there are some of the gifts that, that he speaks about there. Um, and instead of kind of asking what, it, what does this mean, I, I put these, these thoughts down. But it's worth kind of just walking through them here as well. So he talks about the message of wisdom. And, and Paul would be referring to that ability really to give wise counsel. Um, enabling a Christian to be especially effective in communicating, communicating God's wisdom to others. A message of knowledge would be really closely connected to that. Um, may refer to an exceptionally thorough knowledge of truths of the Bible and the ability to apply those truths to specific situations, um, to communicate them effectively. And we've, we've probably, if you, if you think about this, we probably can think of individuals that we've come across in our lives that, that you see this, um, don't you? Um, people that you, you feel very comfortable going to when, when you've got a question because they just have that ability to take this truth of Scripture and apply it to this situation. Um, faith, not speaking of saving faith, but to an extraordinary ability to look to God for help in specific circumstances and to encourage others to do so also. Confidence that God can and will use his power marvelously for the benefit of his people. Um, you think about sometimes those people at a, a congregational meeting or within a council. Yeah, we, we can go ahead and do this. The, Lord, the, Lord's, the Lord's got it. The Lord will provide. Um, that's really kind of what's being referred to there. Um, healing gifts and power to do miracles, just what it says. Um, not really much more needs to be said there, but we can rightfully say only when the Spirit wills it. Um, we'll talk about that more as we go along. Gift of prophecy, 
um, the preaching and proclamation of what God has revealed in the word and or the direct revelation to an individual by the Holy Spirit. Um, oftentimes prophecy does carry with it telling future events, but it does not have to. Prophecy is simply speaking God's word. Um, a word oftentimes referred to, uh, used to refer to prophecy is the idea of forth telling, telling something, making it known. And sometimes in that forth telling, they're telling future events too. The evaluating of spirits, distinguishing between the spirit of God and evil spirits, um, because whenever God speaks to us in his word, guess what the devil does? He tries to distort it or confuse us about it. This would have been especially important for the New Testament Christian church, right? Before the word was, before the gospel was written down, before the New Testament was written. Um, is this really from the Spirit of God? Is this from, from Satan? And then different kinds of tongues and interpretation of tongues. Um, that'd be speaking in foreign languages one never learned, like we hear about on Pentecost, or uttering sounds that are not known languages, and then the ability to interpret it. Um, it's interesting as you read through this section, um, Paul really throughout these three chapters that he talks about spiritual gifts really downplays um, the speaking in tongues. Um, and, and he really downplays it if there's nobody there to interpret something. He says, if, if, if you speak in tongues and nobody's there to interpret, sit down, be quiet. You're not edifying anybody. That's basically what he says. Um, and, and so it's, it's kind of sad when you see um, church bodies that emphasize it as being, here's the emphasis. Here's, here's the way you really know you have the Spirit. Um, Paul, Scripture, never speaks that way at all. Um, yes, Gemma. Yeah, doesn't do any good. Um, looking there at that last question, are we to look for all of these gifts in every age? You mean like every, what do you mean by every age? Like every year? Or like every not, not age of like, um, you know, but age of, of the church, all the centuries. Rachel? No. Um, and, you know, the section is not saying that we should have all these specific gifts. What it really is saying is that the Holy Spirit gives gifts when he wants to give them, and he gives them to the people according to the needs and according to the opportunities given. Um, there was a need for people to be speaking in tongues at that time. There was a need for miracles. Why? Because it was confirming their message. You and I, we confirm our message today too, don't we? By doing what? Grabbing the Bible and saying, here's what God's word says. That's how we confirm the message. They didn't have that ability to be able to pull out um, the gospel of Matthew and say, see, Jesus said this. Um, and so the miracles confirm their message as being from God. Um, can God still do this? Yeah. Um, and what's always, what's always the, the litmus test for all of it? Does it agree with God's word? And is it always pointing back to the word? and to Christ, and elevating Christ? Or is it elevating the person? If it's elevating the person, there's reason to, to question, to doubt. Dig it deeper. Why is there so much emphasis on the same spirit? Evan. Yeah, there, there's the word, and you, that's the second time you used it, which is good. Um, it's emphasizing the unity, isn't it? 
Um, same spirit. Is if the same spirit is giving these gifts, well, what does that mean? Um, don't selfishly use them. The church is not many organizations, but one. And if the same spirit is giving all of those gifts, as we'll see as Paul goes along here, he's giving what is needed to whom he so pleases, and each one has the gift he wants them to have. Um, it, we're really going to see of how as we go through this section, there is no place for arrogance or pride in the use of spiritual gifts, and there's no place for envy or jealousy in this aspect. Because if I have this gift, I do not have to be envious about the gift of somebody else and want theirs, because the Spirit's given me exactly what, I want, what he wants me to have. And there's no reason for me to look down on somebody who has a, what might look like a lesser gift, because guess what? That gift's just as important. The Spirit gave them exactly what he wanted them to have. And, and there certainly is application here, isn't there, um, to, to us as well, right? Um, I don't know if, if, if you ever did this, if you, if, if, if you were blessed with children, um, you know, when your child does something and they do something that maybe either is not the way you would do it or maybe did something that you would rather them not do and you said to your spouse, right, um, do you know what your child did? Um, you know, and, and, and so, so the, the emphasis gets placed on, you know, this is what yours did. Um, and it becomes a, a, a me, you, us, they. Um, I think there's always such a great need for us in our congregation in our congregations throughout our synod, but in our congregation, especially with you know a two campuses, right? It's really not us and them, you know, us here and them there. It's, it's we. Um, and how true that is too when it comes to aspects within the church um, committees, council. Um, it's not we and them as if there's this competition between them. Um, it's us. And, and it, have you ever noticed, and this, this, is, this is good biblical thought, good biblical advice in, in all of our relationships, but, but within the congregation as well. Um, have you ever noticed that there's this mindset that kind of goes like this? So you don't agree with me. That means you're wrong. And thus, you become someone that needs to be conquered. You ever notice that? That's what happens. You don't agree with me. That means you're wrong. You're somebody to be conquered. But guess what? Our brothers and sisters within a congregation are not the enemy. And that needs to be repeated and needs to be just emboldened and emblazoned on our hearts and our minds. Um, the devil is the enemy. The evil forces of this world, um, you know, really even, you know, and that, that person that rubs me the wrong way um, at, at work, they're not the enemy either. It's, and we just get that mindset that if you disagree with me, you're wrong and now I got to conquer you. It's not the case. Um, and, and as we talk about this, um, and, and you see the way the Lord, Lord through Paul just builds up this unity within a congregation and, and talks about all from the same spirit. He's just highlighting this fact. This is not the way we want to look at things. Let's take question B. Under what circumstances might the exercise of even God-given gifts cause trouble in a Christian congregation today? Jeff. I think you brought up some of them already that you could be jealous of somebody else's abilities and that might upset you or you could think you're better than somebody else just because one gives you feedback. Yeah, very good. 
Pride and jealousy, don't they? Um, so, so frequently come in in that, set, that, that aspect um, or, or even a judgmental attitude towards, towards others. Yes, Evan? And so kind of a kind of a real life example then of the jealousy or the pride that, that's being spoken of there. Yes, Jeff. Yeah, harkens back a little bit, right, of, of this past Sunday. Um, our grumbling and complaining, our resentment, um, ultimately, what does it come down to? It's a grumbling and complaining and resentment towards, towards God. Um, it's the reason why he, he held the Israelites accountable the way that he did. Um, probably a good place for us to pause, since we're at six, excuse me, 7.30. Um, and we'll pick up with that that thought as, as the Apostle Paul will take what he says there in verses 1 to 11 and then give um, the, the example of the human body, um, of the way the human body works together. That's the way that Christians want to work together with the spiritual gifts that have been given. Um, let's close with prayer. Jesus, your blood and righteousness, my beauty are my glorious dress. Mid flaming worlds in these arrayed, with joy shall I lift up my head. Bold shall we stand in that great day, cleansed and redeemed, no debt to pay. For by your cross absolved we are from sin and guilt, from fear and shame. Amen. So we'll pick up in the middle of 56. And just if anybody needed the heads up, um, tomorrow the church parking lot will be begun work on it, so you will not be able to drive into the parking lot tomorrow and Thursday, tomorrow and Friday. It's okay on Saturday. It should be, but.